everybody. Before we start, I have a couple of ground rules to mention. Please do not tweet today. Please do not text today. Please just bring your whole self here and be here. OK? Everybody agree? Yes. <laughs> OK. With that said, uh, I am absolutely ecstatic to welcome back to Harvard Law School Justice Anthony Kennedy, one of our own alumni. And let me say, <laughs> Who, who has never seen any of the buildings I've been in this morning. <laughs> we couldn't be more thrilled that you're here. Uh, I'm going to say a few more things about you, but then try to have as much time for discussion. First, I'll ask some questions and then open it up for discussion. You are allowed to applaud at any of the further descriptions that I have about him. So Justice Kennedy is from California. <laughs> Justice Kennedy studied political science. <laughs> Justice Kennedy went to Stanford. <laughs> I, I wondered what would happen with that one. Justice Kennedy also studied at the London School of Economics. <laughs> Justice Kennedy practiced law. <laughs> Thank you. And, Justice and didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> no. Justice Kennedy taught constitutional law. Come on, come on. Okay. Oh, all right. I'm done with the applauding. Um, when Justice Kennedy was in private practice for a substantial period of time and taught for a substantial period of time, and most amazingly, continues to teach uh, at the McGeorge School of Law, where he, I believe, is still the longest. In a teacher on the faculty there. Is that I, true? I suppose that's true. <laughs> President Gerald Ford appointed him to the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and then he joined the United States Supreme Court in 1988. And there he has written landmark uh, opinions in fields as disparate as freedom of speech, habeas on the war on terror, campaign finance, and marriage equality. He is the decisive vote in crucial cases. Uh, a magazine had a photograph of him that was a flattering photograph that called him the decider. Uh, and he is an ardent defender of liberty and of dignity, a word that has not previously to his time on the court been uh, mentioned as often as it has and, been. And you're since. very gracious not to use the term swing vote. I hate that <laughs> term. It, 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 it has this visual image of these spatial gyrations. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the cases swing, I don't. <laughs> Thank you for not using that. Yeah. You said once, we must never lose sight of the fact that the law has a moral foundation, and we must never fail to ask ourselves not only what the law is, but what the law should be. And I thank you for that. I think that that is a crucial reminder to us. Uh, about the relationship between law and morality and law and justice. My first question to you is, what did you learn from your early jobs that you find yourself using now, or just what did you learn? So you were in private practice, you were a professor, you were, as I know, you were once a state senate page, is that right? Right, I, I was not happy in school, they didn't have the term homeschooling, so. My parents thought it would be good for me to be the only page the Senate had ever had and put me in a smoke-filled room for four years. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm learning, I'm, I was teaching at a school for judges in the Netherlands, in, in Europe, and most parts of the world. Uh, when you graduate from law school, you have two choices. You go into practice or you go into the, the government service and the judiciary. Um, and we can get into that. We're very fortunate that we have the Anglo-American tradition where we choose our judges, the judges from the ranks of the practicing bar. But I was teaching at the school for judges in the Netherlands, and they're very young people, um, just a couple of years out of law school, and some uh, for two or three days. And some young lady of one of the new judges raised her hand, and she said, how can I be a good judge if I still have so much to learn about the world around me? And it was one of these moments where everybody's quiet, expecting some, some answer. And I, I said, 
you will never be a good judge unless you ask yourself that question every day. Oh, that's wonderful. And the, the, the part of judging is, is to ask, why am I doing this? What, what, and the, the law uh, is, is a, a, a discipline, an ethic, a philosophy, a, a commitment, uh, that you always go back to first principles. A Cardozo, uh, read the nature of the judicial process. I, I know it's, it's not terribly exciting in parts, but it's short. <laughs> and, 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 and Cardozo, in uh, the first paragraph of his book, uh, said, people ask judges, how do they go about deciding a case? And for one who's been a judge a long time, and who's done it hundreds, perhaps thousands of times, uh, you would think the answer would be easy. Nothing could be further than the yes. truth. So you rely on all of your experience. And, uh, so why, and, does, why does law matter? And why do lawyers matter? Well, in, in, in our country, in our heritage, in our tradition, and it's our destiny, and it's our purpose, we in part define ourselves um, as committed to the rule of law. And we're bound by this thing called the, the Constitution. Uh, Constitution, uh, is, you can use the word with a capital C or a small c. A capital C is the document that judges interpret. Uh, that, uh, Here it is. That, that, uh, <laughs> that was hammered out in, in the summer of 1787, and after a month in Philadelphia, they had nothing, no federalism, no uh, separation of powers after a month. And Washington kept them there. You didn't walk out on the general. They would occasionally say the 18th century equivalent of we're out of here. Uh, and then Washington would say, please stay, gentlemen. You didn't walk out on the general. So that's 1787. In 1789, it's adopted. 1791, the Bill of Rights. So that's the Constitution of the capital C. The one lawyers interpret, the one that we're committed to, the one that, that they're all sworn to, the one that belongs not to just to a bunch of lawyers and judges, belongs to all of us, and that defines us. Defines us as a people. The Constitution with a small c is the Constitution that um, Aristotle, Hobbes, Locke, uh, Rousseau, Harrington, uh, Jacques Martin um, used to describe the, the small c. The sum total of manners, mores, customs, traditions, morality, ethics of the people. The closer the two come together, together the stronger we are. It's the small c constitution, who we are, what our culture is, how we behave, that the rest of the world watches, considers, weighs, when they're thinking about what the United States means and what freedom means. And we're maybe getting a little bit off the track, but uh, we, 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 have, we have a duty to ourselves and, and to the rest of the world to show that this small C constitution mirrors our big C constitution, not in a legalistic term, but in our sense that we have a commitment. Aristotle gave, um, I reread his politics uh, two summers ago, I think. And uh, Aristotle gave democracy a low grade, as did Plato. They, they had the list of possible forms of government. And he gave democracy a pretty low mark as a desirable form of government. And uh, in rereading it, my conclusion was he thought that democracy did not have the capacity to mature. And it's our destiny to prove him wrong. And we'll get into law in a minute, but uh, the other, I, I was, with my, my, my uh, granddaughter is a ballet dancer with the New York City Ballet. And she's still in high school. Uh, she uh, was dancing in uh, Chautauqua, which Westerners have never heard of. Uh, it's in near Buffalo, New York. And she had won a choreography, so, so you go to see your grandchild. And they had a, a seminar, Dean, uh, in ancient, ancient Greece, uh, Periclean Athens, roughly 500 BC. And they said, would you be on the panel? I said, oh, OK. 
you can afford my hourly rate, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't know what to say. These are real Greek scholars. And I said, would the Greeks think we were free, and would we think the Greeks uh -huh. are free? Such an interesting question. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I said, just in case somebody from the National Enquirer is here, I, I know men only, <laughs> slavery, I, I know, I know. Um, but, uh, so we, we, we wouldn't think of the Greeks are free because we think in, in freedom in terms of individual rights. And the Greeks had some of this, and Antigone mm -hmm. makes her point conscience. of conscience. Mm -hmm. um, but for the Greeks, freedom was the capacity and the duty to engage in rational, civic discourse to plan the destiny of your people. And the Greeks have had a required, the Athenians had a, had a required oath uh, that every citizen at the age of 18, male only, uh, had to take. Uh, and that was, it's a very beautiful oath. Uh, and it is, we uh, swear that we will engage in civic discussions and in rational uh, conversation to the end that Athens be more free, more beautiful, and more safe for our children than it is for us. And Athens failed because the Greeks we're not faithful to that oath. And we have to think about our civic duty, and that's where the law can be an example. That's where we can make a difference. When, when you're in, in law school, you're learning a language. It's the language of the law. Uh, one of us in my generation can pick up a telephone and talk to a lawyer a continent away and two generations removed, and we've never met. But in a sense, we know each other because we speak the common language. We all had contracts in the first year towards, we can talk about the curriculum later. But, um, uh, and, 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 and we have this bond, this tie, this kinship, this common purpose. Uh, and this is the language of the law. And the language of the law has a restraint and a discipline and a heritage uh, and an elegance and a, and a grammar and a logic. Uh, it's different from the civic discourse, different from the political branch. It's not better, not worse, it's different. And, and we can't expect everyone to talk in the language of the law. The world would be a boring place if that were true. Um, but that's what you're here for. Is there it's, one language of the law that's universal, or are they distinctive for each country? Well, um, I, I, I'm... As, my remarks earlier indicated, in, in my view, the verdict on freedom is still out. The verdict on the rule of law is, is still out in half, half of the world. And I, you know, I, I was thinking about it as I was walking through today. Uh, I, I sometimes teach law and literature. And one, one of the things, I think, for corrections, you, you just have to read um, One Day in the Life of Ivan wow. Denisa, that's by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And if Solzhenitsyn is one of my favorite authors, later in life he did and said some rather strange things. But uh, <laughs> um, Harvard, is, it, is there a Charter Day speech? The Charter Day, he was the speaker yes. at yes. Charter Day, which is, Harvard thinks it's like the Nobel Prize or something. <laughs> and, 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 and he was the, the spe speaker. So I was in California at the time. This is pre-internet fax machine. So I waited for a couple of days to get his speech. This was my great hero. And I finally got a copy of it. It was in the New York Times. And I was so disappointed that uh, he attacked the West for its legalistic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, frame of mind, for its legalistic perspective, for its legalistic. And he, he said something like, any civilization that defines itself in legal terms um, does not understand that the, the, the the tissues of, of humanity, something like that. Uh, and I was terribly disappointed. I couldn't figure But then after a couple of days, I figured out, you know, law to him means something very different. And as you move roughly uh, eastward from the United States, and I'm afraid westward as well, um, the law becomes more remote, more threatening, more authoritarian. In Solzhenitsyn's experience, in his history and his culture, in his heritage, I'm afraid to stay still. 
The law was a yukas, a command, a, a decree, a mandate. For us, it's a promise. It's a promise. Uh, it, it's a promise that if you commit yourself uh, to an ethical course of conduct and to being a good citizen in the, in the community, you will be free. Mm -hmm. It's very different. So mm -hmm. law is an expectation. You made so, so, so the idea of law is different. You made a reference to the curriculum, so I can't resist. What do you remember from your time at Harvard Law School? Did you learn anything that you use? What did you study? What, what can you say I about that? I remember a lot of the cases I had in law school better than the cases I've written. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Ask me all about Hawkins versus McGee, Pal <laughs> Pal's graph. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what, what is it? The, the, uh, the, the train starts, the door closes, the conductor pushes the passenger, the passenger <laughs> drops the thing. The, 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 uh, uh, and, the, and the firecrackers explode and the scale falls and hits Miss Allen. I, I know that. Uh, but, uh, no, the, the, you, uh, you, at least in my generation, you tend to think of legal problems in the context of the courses you had. Um, I have checked with my classmates, class of 61. None of us ever heard of the term environmental law. Wow. Didn't hear the phrase, didn't know the phrase. And I'll write what I think is a statute of limitations case, civil procedure, little box. And, and uh, no, 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 it's, a, it's an environmental law claim. Uh, our, uh, we had agency, I couldn't have practiced law without it. Go into the library and look up and see what agency is. <laughs> Um, it's, it's mentioned it's, at the beginning of the corporations class. Yeah, it's scattered to the birds on corporations and torts. And I, I mean, I, I just couldn't practice in a, in a small business practice without knowing the law of age. But anyway, uh, so they, now, uh, I looked when I, 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 I was uh, here, here a half hour early, and I, and I asked if they would get me a, a course book of the 61 uh, oh, course curriculum? offered uh, wow. at Harvard. Uh, no criminal procedure, which did not surprise me. Uh, Rehnquist and O'Connor had never heard of criminal procedure. Uh, Scalia had, and I had not from law school because it weren't, uh, they didn't teach it when Nino and I were here. Um, but we were in the academy and, and, we, and, and we heard it. Uh, so Rehnquist and O'Connor would think of every, what we would call criminal procedure cases, which we think of as, as, as a unified doctrine. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a case in federalism. Oh, wow. Should the federal court, wow. and, um, and because in, in a way, to, and this helped me in, in my practice because I did some criminal work and I taught con law, and when I was here, Gideon, uh, Gideon wasn't decided when I was here. All right. Uh, Miranda wasn't decided when I was So these cases came out in the 60s, and in the curriculum, uh, constitutional law professors around the country had all these criminal procedure cases, what we now call criminal procedure cases, and they went to the deans and they said, this is too much, we, mm -hmm. we can't do this. And almost the uniform response was to have a course in Separate. criminal procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in practice, since I taught this, uh, and that was one of the reasons I th thought I'd stick with constitutional law for a little bit longer, because it didn't relate to my practice, was it began to relate to my practice in the criminal procedure area. And I was hired uh, as associate counsel in a number of criminal cases because uh, uh, Map, Escobedo, um, um, Miranda, even Gideon are all, all new concepts. Did you get, were you called on? Was it all Socratic method in the, your classes? Oh, no, some yes, some, some no. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't know who your role models are until year, years later. You look back and say, that was a role model. I had certain judges who were role models, and certain professors, when I taught, I either consciously, in some cases, unconsciously, uh, very much admired Clark Bice. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought he was the model for paper chase. I don't uh, know if he was, but he thought uh, he was. But I, I, and, and, and really, Ben Kaplan, if the student would ask a question which was really off the point and not a very good question, he would never put the student down. He would turn the question, well, now that bring, and he would make the question really relevant. It would make the students look. And the other was, uh, <laughs> was uh, an, a gentleman, which I think is very important. And, um, uh, and, the, uh, and the other was Donald Turner, and oh. he taught agency. agency. And, 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 and on those days, the agency was required first year, uh, half, half year yes. course. Yes. 
And the dean would call the professor and say, now, Professor Turner, the, the good news is you can have your antitrust class at the time you want. The bad news is you teach agency. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was scattered to the birds on the faculty. And so um, I had Turner for agency, and, my, and he talked in something of a monotone. Uh, sounded colorless until you listened to what he was saying. And some of my guys said, oh, we got agency with Turner. I said, no, no, listen, listen. He was a master of the Socratic method. He would ask a question, come into a 50-minute class. He'd come in, he'd ask a question, generally relating to a case. Then he'd just ask a series of questions, and then the, it would be 50 minutes, the bell's about to ring. Then he'd ask the same question he'd asked at the first. But the whole world had changed. It was like a sonnet. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I, so I tried. I tried. I, I taught. My class was 6 to 9.30 Monday nights. Oh, wow. Uh, and with a 20-minute break. And um, you can't sustain the Socratic method, or I couldn't, at least uh, for that whole three hours. So I, I would, for a, maybe an hour, 10, an hour, 20, be able then afterwards I'd have to switch. You mentioned criminal procedure. You have actually been very uh, vocal about criminal justice. You have. Uh, made important statements on solitary confinement, on overcrowding in prisons. Could you talk to us about what is the role of the courts in uh, criminal justice and what's the role of the rest of us? Uh, many people think that there are real problems with our criminal justice system. Churchill said a society is measured by how it treats the least deserving of its citizens. And uh, I wanted to see uh, the 1961 catalog was about that, like that, and so I'd, I'd ask mm -hmm. your office for the uh, for the current catalog, and it's like the man who ordered room service on the Titanic. He said, "This is I wanted ice, but this is too much. I'm mean, just like this." <laughs> uh, and, uh, and 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 I and I wanted to see, Dean, if if you had courses on on corrections and so forth. In in my era, um, lawyers. Judges, law professors, law students were fascinated with the guilt innocence process, mm -hmm. and 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 that would include later uh, uh, post conviction release, uh, uh, 28 U.S.C. Uh, 2254, 2255 habeas corpus. Um, but uh, a after the the trial process, then the conviction process, post -conviction, we, we throw away the key, corrections are for someone else. Lawyers not interested in corrections at all. And everyone thought someone else was looking at it. In California, my home state, we had close to 200,000 prisoners uh, a year. Uh, and now we're uh, down to 120,000. Uh, and the federal system, you have over 200,000 in prison. Um, and, uh, and then uh, and, 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 uh, pre-trial release, pre-trial diversion, and uh, 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 probation. Pro pro probation is, I think, maybe in the federal system, my guess is around 50,000, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, we don't pay any attention to it. Everybody thinks, well, we think it's for the lawyers or the uh, uh, so people in the sociology or but A, as you, as you indicated, or I think rightly, uh, Dean, is, I think it's everyone's job, but it's particularly, uh, I, I, I think we have to step up. And I was going to look to see if you had courses in, in corrections. Um, in, uh, inadequate, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and solitary confinement. Uh, is, 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 people are in there for years. I was, when I was in the Army, they gave us training because I was in a uh, unit that had combat stuff and training for it. Uh, and so they locked us up uh, in, a, in a cell and, and we're, uh, some of us were tortured just very slightly. And after four hours in the cell, I was going, going mad. These people have been 40 days, 40 months, 20 years in solitary confinement. It drives men mad. And uh, we, 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 don't even, we don't even think about it. And in California, the cost of the pris per, per prisoner is about $35,000 a year per prisoner. 
And the Prison Guards Association, the Correctional Officers Association, uh, is the strongest lobby in the state of California. And they have planned prisons to go up the Central Valley and the Northern Valley in small towns uh, so that the prison guards are a large part of the population and they can control who's legislated, who's elected. And they are against shorter sentences and this is sick. This is sick. And we've, we've, got, we've got to do something about it. And it, I tell people $30,000 per inmate and if I have to use, the, we have to use that cost calculus in order to get people to think about a human dimension that, that's fine with me. Um, you build a we'll, coalition. We'll, we'll go that route mm -hmm. if we have to. But we really, uh, uh, it, 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 um, it, it seems to me, um, it, it used to be judges had considerable uh, discretion in, in resentencing. Um, we had a judge in um, San Diego, a very fine district judge, and he went out of his own pocket, this is years ago, before the sentencing guidelines and before mandatory minimums, which I think are terrible. Um, and he went to the hardware store and he bought the biggest keys he could get. And if he gave uh, probation uh, to a prisoner, he said, here's this key. Now, if you violate, I'm going to take away this key. And this was something we, people could, it was visual. Wow. And people That's years crazy. later said, I have that key wow. on, my, on my bookshelf or my mantle. Wow. And wow. So, th th so, but judges, um, now it's all with the guidelines and so forth. And, uh, We've had very few, some judges have resigned, they said, well, we're not going to do this. But they don't get much attention. So it, it, it's everybody's job. And it's, I, I, I think it's just an, an ongoing injustice of great proportions. And wish, it, it seemed to me that, that uh, in, in one of my speeches to the ABA some years ago, this was the, my subject, our, our sentences in the United States are eight times longer than for equivalent crimes in England and Western Europe, eight times longer. Um, We're the most incarcerated nation in the history of nations. Right, and uh, this, 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 this is wrong. Now, it's, you're not gonna save $33,000 a year if you do it right, because you're gonna have, a, have to have a lot of supervision and rehabilitation training and so forth, but we've, we, we've got to look at this. You know, your, your focus on dignity I mentioned before, what does dignity mean to you? Well, if you're writing uh, an opinion under uh, the Due Process Clause, Fifth or Fourteenth Amendment, uh, and, 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 and liberty, um, you uh, can't just repeat the word, you have to find a synonym to explain. And it's not just for stylistic interest, uh, so that you're avoiding repetition that puts the reader to sleep. It's in order to elaborate meaning. And in um, the European Convention on, on Human Rights, the, the word dignity is used. Um, and it, it seems to me to sum up uh, the meaning of, of human individual worth. Mm -hmm. And so it's a word that it seems to me is, is helpful. And there's an equality dimension there, that people have equal dignity. That is correct. I, 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 the equal, equal protection and liberty on the due process cause have, have, a, have a linkage that hasn't been thoroughly explored. Mm -hmm. But I think you are exploring it in your opinions, and that's very, very powerful. Well, you mentioned opinions. Who is the audience? Who's the ideal audience for your opinions? Who are you writing for? Well, you write an opinion differently if it's railroad reorganization mm -hmm. uh, or human rights. I mean, you have a different audience. And one of the purposes of an opinion is to see if the opinion can produce and garner allegiance to what the law does. Uh, and you, you write these opinions, you, you don't know how they're going to be received by the academy and by the, uh, by the profession and, and, and by people that are interested in the court. And so you, uh, if, if you write an opinion like, oh, well, Lawrence versus Texas, um, or in the, in the free speech area, I, I, I think you should write it so that uh, a broad general audience 
can know and understand the reasons the Supreme Court gave for, 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 its, for its decision. The press is pretty good about saying what we did. And to cover the Supreme Court, they like it because they have about three months to do all the background. They have pictures of the litigants and they can, even, they can maybe even write up what they think will be their article depending on the, on the way it goes. So, um, uh, so the press does a pretty good job. But the, the court has to, years, uh, when I was first on the court, we had the, uh, the flag burning case, uh, te Texas, Texas versus, versus Johnson, Johnson, Texas versus Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple days before the, the, the case came out, I thought, you know, people are gonna be really mad at the court about this. Uh, and I think, well, I'll write a little something. So I wrote a short opinion. Uh, very short, con uh, co completely concurring, joining uh, Justice Brennan's opinion wholly. I, I wasn't trying to detract from it. Um, but um, I, I said it's poignant but fundamental that the flag protects those who hold it in contempt. And I, I wrote this short thing, and I told my, my colleagues, I said, this is going to be very controversial. And I think 80 senators got to the floor of the Senate. Mm -hmm and protested this decision, and the first President Bush took the week off and went to flag factories, you know. And um, uh, so I, I, I wrote this, this little thing. And I was in um, uh, California uh, to see my children were still there at that time and going to school. And I had lunch with the two boys. Uh, we met at the Universal House of Pancakes or something. And, um, <laughs> Some, somebody, uh, some, some guy came by and, and said, are you Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court? And I thought, this is some C-SPAN junkie that watches the, <laughs> the budget hearings or something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he said, I can see with your family, but he said, I was a, I'm a solo practitioner like you were in Northern California, uh, in Ukiah, a very small town, and the reason I'm there is uh, to be with my dad. I lost my mom years ago but this is my hometown and my dad's there. And he never comes into my office. Uh, and the San Francisco Chronicle reported the flag burning case. And the day afterward he came in and, he, and, and there were a lot of people in my office. He slams the newspaper down and says, you should be ashamed to be a lawyer. And he said the reason was he was a prisoner of war for two and a half years in Germany. And the prisoners would get little bits of red, white, and blue cloth and they'd make a little flag and pass it around for morale. And then the guards would find it, and then they'd make another. And he said, he was infuriated with your decision. So he said, I didn't know what, he said, hey, I gave him a copy of what you wrote, because it's short and written, uh, you know, for a, 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 general, a general understanding mm -hmm. of what the Constitution means to all of us. And he came back two days later and said, you can be proud to be a lawyer. Wow, so it, so wow. It, wow. So that, that, that was one that worked for one person. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have actually talked explicitly about the educational role that the court plays, that the court is an educator. And you know, maybe because you have been an educator your whole life, you, you see that. But is it through opinions? Are there other ways in which the court can be an educator? Well, uh, I, I suppose, uh, it, in, in part, again, we're talking about civility. Uh, we have to be an example of uh, the fact that uh, you can have a disagreement and resolve it in, in a rational, principled way. I think it was Carlisle said that uh, if in an argument you give way to anger, your principal interest is, def is in mm -hmm. defending yourself, not the truth. And so you, you, ha you have to have uh, a very prof professional uh, way of, of disagreeing, disagreeing with, with your colleagues. You're gonna, when you try cases, as a, I had a small practice, and so I went to court all the time. Um, and um, you would some, you, you're gonna have to argue with some judges. They're, they're, uh, some of the judges I were, that were my role models were wonderful judges, and I would make sure the jury was out before I argued with them, uh, the, because the judges really like the, the jurors really like the judge. But there will be some judges who are not going to listen to you, and you're going you're going to. When I when I teach, sometimes I, I want questions, and they're all hesitant to raise their hand. And I said, now how many of you want to practice law? And they raise their hand. I said, 
How many of you would have a state bar certificate of admission on, on your wall or your office? Raise your hand. I said, and, and then my next question is, how many of you will want a little sticker under that, but I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed and shy about arguing in front of judges? I said, that, that's, what you're for. that's what you're here for. That's what you're here for. And, and, and the Socratic method, sometimes, uh, well, it's my pleasure to talk with teachers. I talk about the Socratic method. And there, there are many variations of it. One is whatever the student says, I disagree. Uh, and the other is, uh, the second is, an ab and that's an abuse of the method somewhat. And Socrates abused his own method because his method was, <laughs> he had a point of view and he would ask you questions to bring around to his point of view. Also. But the, the beautiful, the golden um, measure is neither of us know the answer and we ask questions of each <laughs> other in order to find it. And it seems to me perfectly legitimate for professors to use all three of those methods. Mm -hmm. And it's not important for the student to know which one. What, what it, but it's very important for the professor to know. <laughs> yes. Which, which one. <laughs> no, so, I, so, I, I, so I think this is a Socratic method. Because we implis, impliedly warrant, I think, uh, to the world that we teach you skills of advocacy. But um, do we? I mean, do we have a course in how to have? In part, you do that in the Socratic method, and, and you learn uh, the, the, the art and, 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 and the discipline and the necessity of respectful but forceful um, presentation of your arguments, and you do that, do that in the classroom. You mentioned a moment ago role models of judges that you'd had. Who not alive or who not on the court uh, as a Supreme Court justice was uh, someone you admired? I, I knew Earl Warren very well as a young boy can know an older man in, in that time. I mean, he didn't phone me for advice every day. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and our family knew him when, when we knew his children. My, his daughter and my sister were best friends. Um, and uh, Noah, Professor Feldman, yes. has, has a book called The, the Scorpions, Scorpions. Yes. which is a wonderful book. And it shows how unhappy the court was with black Frankfurter Douglas Jackson. And Warren had this wonderful way about it. Warren would be elected governor in the primaries. In California, in those days, you could run a Democrat, rep Republican. He won both. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so he. Hard to imagine anyone doing that right now. And when, <laughs> and well, the, when the Scorpions were at it, um, uh, the, the, uh, President Truman appointed Vincent. He knew the court was unhappy. And they appointed good old friendly poker playing Fred Vincent, uh, whom everybody liked. But uh, he was not effective as Chief Justice because Jackson and Frankfurter Douglas didn't respect his legal ability. So it got worse. And so then Warren. Can I, okay. Can I, I, I'll We're tell fine. this one story about one. Please, okay. please. Uh, because um, this was repeated to me by, by people that were there. Uh, Warren runs with um, Dewey as vice president, uh, 1948, uh, loses. Uh, then uh, in, uh, am I got it right, 1952, uh, Warren wants to be run for president. And he wins the California Republican primary. And by law, the California delegation is Ballot. required to vote for Warren on the first ballot. And the big tussle is between Eisenhower and Taft. And so Warren's in between. And maybe would be the, what the dark the horse or the settlement mm -hmm. candidate or mm -hmm. whatever. So the train leaves from Sacramento, California. And unbeknownst with the delegation, with the California delegation on Warren's on the train, Unbeknownst to Warren, a young man is going up and down the train, and that man gets off the train station and goes to Eisenhower's suite, and he said, my name is Richard Nixon, and California is yours on the second ballot. Warren was infuriated. Wow. Uh, and leaves word that he may go home, might bolt the party, and you know, California, a lot of electoral votes there. So 
Uh, the arrangement is Warren will come by and see Eisenhower. Uh, and Eisenhower said that if Eisenhower were president, Warren would get the first appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States. Wow. Vinson suddenly dies. Uh, and people are congratulating Warren around Sacramento, but the, the phone doesn't ring. One day, two day. Well, then you know this way this works. The staff start talking to each other. And they said, well, you know, we didn't say Chief Justice. Warren said, that's right. But you said the first. <laughs> and this is the first. And that's how Warren was Chief Amazing. So, so he, but I, I admire him very much. Hugo Black, nev I never met him. I, I admired his, his, his jurisprudence. Black missed Tobacco Road by just a hop. <laughs> uh, Self-educated man. Uh, and uh, uh, read uh, uh, deeply in, in, in philosophy and political theory. And uh, I, I, I always thought was, was, a, was a brilliant brilliant guys, Harlan, I, I, both Harlans, but the second. One, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed, one of the, my disappointments in the court is I can't get my colleagues to tell me about my predecessors, uh, they're mostly, but I mean, uh, Br Br Brennan, uh, uh, Blackman, White, wouldn't tell me much about what Life was like. my, my predecessors were like, I, I couldn't quite get a picture. You mentioned scorpions. It seems to be a very different kind of camaraderie on the court right now. How do you get along with your colleagues? How, what, how do you manage looking at someone when you've had fierce disagreements? Well, of course, that's a, a, there's a difference in a personal and a professional disagreement. I mean, well, you're trained to disagree. I mean, that's your duty. You have to do, but you have to do it in a proper way. If you don't do it in a proper way, the civility tends, tends to go. But you know, the, uh, what we like to say is that uh, you know I'll, I'll go in and say, you know this this case, uh, you're, you're, you don't understand evidence, you're ruining criminal procedure, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and remember we're going with dinner to dinner with Marine tonight at six thirty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, it's important to, to know to, to get, have that the you can do both, and, and especially in the practice of law, especially in the practice of law. Uh, in, First case I argued, the opposing counsel asked me afterwards did I want to go out for a drink, and I thought, I hate you. Why would I do that? <laughs> and, and he saw the look on my face. He said, you're going to see a lot more of me than you are of your client. And it was a good point. It was a good point. <laughs> I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute, but I have a few, few more. You, you travel a great deal. You, you, you teach and speak around the world. Uh, how does this affect what you do? How does it affect how you think? Uh, you also travel back to California. How does that influence your outlook? Well, I, I, again, you're uh, in, influenced by the by the world around you, and the travel has helped me. And I, I used to go once a year to China uh, to to teach to teach there. And and the uh, one time I, I and I was being given a dinner. I, I'll tell you later. I really. Work to help start a law school in China because the curriculum was just problem. Law in China and most other places in the world is undergraduate. There are only what five countries in the world with graduate law schools: South Africa, U.S., Canada, Japan. I'm missing one. It's undergraduate most places in the world. Uh, they have a, a graduate school where you sure. can do JD Advanced or study. MA. Yeah. But you know, your law degree is undergraduate. And this, this is that way in China. And their curriculum was just broken. It would be as if you had to pass the bar to memorize the statute of limitations of 50 states. I, you know, who cares? <laughs> uh, and uh, so all the, the, the provosts and the deans uh, agreed with me in the 80s that they, we, they should reform the curriculum. And we had a meeting with, I think, maybe 10 law school, 12 law school deans. But uh, I have to say this gracefully, Dean. China is no stranger to academic intransigence, <laughs> and the faculty weren't going to change their courses. And so our solution was to just bypass it and have a graduate law school. I see. And it's in Senji in the Transnational School of Transnational Law. <laughs> and uh, in China, everything's numbered. China is a billion four. Without the billion, they're the second biggest country in the world. They're the second biggest country in the world without the billion. So <laughs> everything in China is numbers. And uh, for this new law school, uh, they were going to have 150 students for the, the opening class and then add 150 each year until they had three years. 
And it was, it was like the US, they would take music majors, art majors, uh, yeah. physicists, whatever. And uh, for 150 places, I think they had something like 9,000 applications, and then they weeded them down, and they finally they had, they took 500 uh, to do interviews, and they had standard interview questions. And one of the interviews was, uh, why did you want to go to law school? And the Chinese love movies that are in English, UK or, 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 or Hollywood. And uh, any number said they were influenced to go to uh, law school by a movie. And uh, so I thought, well, this will be 12 Angry Men or uh, Witness for the Prosecution. No, no, Legally Blonde. <laughs> and, Harvard Law uh, School. Uh, well, and, I, and I'd never heard of the thing, so I, 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 uh, my, my, my Mary, Mary got it on Netflix and we watched it. And it's a pr actually pretty it's good. It's actually pretty good. It's a pretty good. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but but I but I, I I taught there. It's in Shenzhen, just in, in on the mainland, but just north of Hong Kong. And uh, but I I could see why because these students realized that this school was a new venture. Uh, it was somewhat threatening to them. They were taking a chance, and they. Related to uh, Reese, Reese, Reese Witherspoon. Witherspoon. Yes, it's very good, very good. And had a pink laptop too, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's start to see some hands up. Uh, I have one more that I just want to ask is, uh, Thomas Jefferson once said, I would rather be exposed to the inconveniences attending to too much liberty than to those attending to too small a degree of it. And I wondered about that. Is liberty the most important? And to inconveniences, take for example, some people say that our freedom of speech leads to a coarse public culture because you have to harden your skin against. Uh, well, I and frankly think it. Uh, look, at, the court is often thought of as embracing moral relativism. Moral relativism divism is not only disagreeable, but antithetical to my own philosophy, my personal philosophy. Uh, and relativism leads to skepticism, and skepticism leads to cynicism, and cynicism is corruptive of human values. Um, but how can I believe that and be in the, oh, all movies are the same, all books are good. Uh, anything you want to do is all right. Uh, are you going to teach your children, or do you teach your children that? Of course not. So uh, is this hypocritical? No, no. What we're saying is the government doesn't make the choice. But you have to be, and this is, this is part of our society. Um, no. I'll, I'll guarantee you, buy you a bottle of beer or whatever it is you drink. Um, the next time you hear an interview of a movie that's lousy, or a book that's trash, you say, well, of course, there's a First Amendment right. The, 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 on the comment was, oh, there's a First Amendment. I know that. It's trash. <laughs> uh, and so we have to understand the difference between the liberty the government gives you and your duties as a good person. Just because there's a right doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Correct. Hands. Please identify yourself and ask your question. Th uh, thank you for coming to talk with us, Justice Kennedy. I'm Harry Ruto. I'm a 3L from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, in your time on the court, you've written a lot of um, opinions where you were the decisive judge, the swing judge. And in some of those, you... <laughs> well, we don't use those, that phrase. <laughs> in some of those, you weren't the... You didn't actually write the opinion, but you've been the important fifth vote in a lot of cases. In 50 years, in 100 years, if you could only be remembered for one of those cases, which one would it be? Thank you. Uh, the one I'm writing now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's, a, that's a fair question. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it takes time. Uh, you, you hope that time will be a, a gracious judge. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure. You will be remembered. That we know. Other questions? Uh, there's a mic over here. Can you? Yes. And, and maybe stand up. And but I, I, just, I just might say, you know, these big cases, it's, it's odd the way our time is. Uh, we will spend a lot more time in terms of hours, and in terms of writing some of the technical opinions, some concurrences or dissents that don't see the light of day than we will in these big cases. We run on a very short 
crime cycle. You mentioned the, uh, the marriage case, the gay marriage case. I think that was argued in April. It was late. Uh, when we had other opinions, and I, I had a really tough, I think it was a patent opinion I was going crazy with. And so we just, we just don't have much, much time, so you hope it works out. Wow. But now, let me tell, and let me tell you, you're a, I know you're busy in law school. I, I don't see too many bags under your eyes. You're not studying quite hard enough, but I know how, <laughs> I, know, I know how busy you are. I, I know that. Please, my guarantee is you'll be busier in private practice. Now is the time in which you can talk to your professors and you can think about interesting cases like your questions like your colleague, colleague asked. Now, now's the time to do it. This is very important for you to be in law school. Thank you again, Justice Kennedy, for being here. Uh, my name is Tiernan Kane. I'm a 1L, and my question is about the public duty of, or the duty of public officials outside the judiciary. Um, so as I understand your Obergefell opinion, you claim that new insights into the nature of marriage uh, require uh, states to issue marriage licenses in accord with this alternative uh, version of marriage or understanding of marriage. And I can understand a similar case, uh, probably more attractive to those of us who think that rational norms guide the exercise of sexual autonomy like they do economic autonomy. That would be that new insights into the nature of human life require states to take steps to stop abortions. My question would be, in either of these cases, uh, would you say that there, um, there are any state or federal officials with authority to act according to her own judgment of the truth of new insights or of the soundness of the court's constitutional interpretation? Or would it be illegal for any uh, federal official or state official to um, enforce or to act according to the old understanding of life and the Constitution that she still judges to be the truth of the matter? Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the question was generally, uh, what about, if, if I can, rephrase it in a fair way. Uh, what, 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 what is the duty of a public official if he or she cannot in good conscience and consistent with their own personal and religious beliefs enforce a law that they think is uh, morally corrupt? Um, do you know how many, how many judges do you think resigned in the Third Reich? <laughs> Um, I, great respect, it seems to me, has to, has to be given to people who resign rather than do something they think is morally wrong in, in, order, to make, in order to make a point. Uh, however, uh, the rule of law is that as a public official, in performing your legal duties, you are bound to, to enforce, enforce the law. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to see whether or not what you're doing is transgressing your own personal philosophy. This requires considerable introspection. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fair question that officials can and, and should, should ask, ask themselves. Um, but um, certainly in an offhand comment, it would be difficult for me to say that people are free to ignore a decision of the Supreme Court. Lincoln went through this in the <laughs> Dred, Dred Scott case. Um, and uh, it's, it's, these, are, these are difficult moral questions. Mm -hmm. next, next one. Where's the microphone? Where? Uh, but, but uh, you know, in, in, in the law, you have an ethical obligation. I, I did some domestic relation work. In California, it's, uh, the community property was, was on the table, so it was a, and you had accountants, and there was a, a big, big legal fees and this and so on. I had a, a, a client come, and I, uh, he was one of my uh, good business clients. He had a very substantial business and a, a sad divorce, uh, which we couldn't seem to heal. And, um, he said, now you ask for custody of the kids and then we'll get a better property settlement agreement. I said, I won't do that. He said, well, you're my lawyer, you have to do it. I said, man, go, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it. It seemed to me that this was just wrong. I, I wasn't gonna put the kids uh, uh, welfare. Ha happiness mm -hmm. and, 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 and welfare and good relations with both of their parents 
uh, up on the block. And you just have, you just have to do this as, as an attorney. You, you have a, uh, an, 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 ethical, an ethical undertaking. And I, I seem to think this, this idea of ethical counseling is disappearing from the practice to some extent, to some extent. Although, because sometimes I, well, I went, I had a divorce case, and it was a tremendous sum of money on either side, and we had accounts and training, and it was settled. And we had documents that, that had to be signed. It was in my office with uh, deeds and corporations as and so forth. It was all settled. And they were in the middle of this settlement, and uh, the husband said to the wife, and I'll be by Friday to pick up the banjo. She said, no, the banjo is mine. And she, and she said, it was my Uncle Fred's. He said, but he gave it to you because I'm the one that played the banjo. So pretty soon, yeah, the attorneys happened. looked at each other. This settlement thing is going down over the banjo? <laughs> and uh, we, my, we took a recess, and uh, my, the uh, attorney on the other side, we agreed we could buy him five banjos. Uh, so we finally ended up, I was, uh, my solution was we had joint custody of the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> so you can work these things the traveling out. traveling banjo. Okay, uh, here's one right here, yes. Justice Kennedy, thank you for coming. Um, I'm George Mulia, 1L. Um, you mentioned earlier in your talk. A little louder. Oh, sorry, you mentioned earlier in your talk about judges learning about the world around them. How do you and your colleagues go, go about that? Thank you. Oh, well, it's, it's pretty hard. We're, we're in, uh, in, in part in a, in a different age. Uh, I was looking at a, uh, a cross-examination in a, a, a personal injury case not long ago. It was an automobile accident, intersection accident. And um, the uh, attorney, it was a deposition. Oh, no, 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 this, this, was, uh, this was a trial. And the attorney said, uh, and what gear were you in at the moment of impact? And the answer was uh, Gucci sweats and Reeboks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I mean, your generation just doesn't use the term gear anymore. <laughs> okay, there's one over here. Oh, actually, I said the one. But we'll do both of you. So, yeah. Uh, I'm David. I'm a one L as well. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, five years later, uh, from. Uh, Citizens United, and as we approach uh, next year's election, I'm curious if you can stand by some of the assumptions that underlie your opinion there, uh, if, if money is really um, not a corrupting force, uh, and if corporations are really people. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, 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 certainly, in, in my own view, um, what happens with money in, in, in politics is, is, is not good. Um, and in some, some traveling, um, my questions are, uh, what happens in England, in Switzerland, and in, in Europe with the campaign advertising? And there's different answers, none of them completely satisfactory. In part, the election cycle's shorter. In, in part, you have multi-member districts. Um, I, I'm not sure there's any good end, but remember, the government of the United States stood in front of our court and said that it was lawful and necessary under the act to ban a book that was written about Hillary Clinton. Or they said that it would apply to a book written about Hillary Clinton uh, in the prohibited period of six, three months before the election. That, 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 can't, that can't be right. Um, and I, I, I wasn't surprised that the New York Times was incensed that their little monopoly effect our thinking was being taken away. Uh, I was surprised, Dean, at, at how virulent their attitude was. Because um, they had, and the last time I looked, the New York Times was a corporation. <laughs> um, and this, this meant that the Sierra Club, uh, or the Chamber of Commerce in a small town couldn't take out an ad. It's, it seemed to me that there was a tremendous speech speech problem here. If the, I could the, have re, one. The result is not uh, happy. I mean, it, it does seem to me that one of the things is disclosure. Yes. Uh, you, you live in this cyber age, 
You don't need to wait for three months after the election for a report on who gave the money. It can be done in 24 hours. If the voters don't like the people who are funding you, don't vote for them. So if we're, I, that's not working the way it should. But. Right, exactly. If I could have a follow-up, the, the, your, your opinion says, rightly, there can be disclosure and we have the technology to do it, but we have a political lockjam. So the FEC, the FCC, the SEC all have the authority to require the disclosure of campaign contributions, and none of them have. So and, and it goes back to, you know, we have this hostile, fractious dialogue. Look, look at the names of some of our TV shows. Hardball, Crossfire. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we have to change, change things. Well, I see people are, are leaving. You asked about traveling. Um, uh, not too many years ago, I went to Poland and was talking uh, to, again, um, to, uh, to, to the uh, law faculty at the University of Warsaw. And the, it was September, and the students hadn't, were, were going to arrive the, the following uh, week. Uh, but the, I was talking to the faculty, and then people came in and whispered, and they said, oh, Justice Kennedy, they said our incoming law students are here for orientation. Would you talk to them? So they were about 80 or 90. And I said, I'm Justice Kennedy here to tell you about the court. And, uh, and uh, indicated I like it. And a student uh, raised his hand and he said, uh, you know, um, uh, federalism is very important, uh, but money goes to the uh, states, to the federal government, and then back to the states with conditions on it. Doesn't this undermine federalism? Uh, th these are basically high school seniors hmm. there for the, 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 hmm. their first uh, week of college are going to be the final week. And so we talked about that. And another student said, now separation of powers is very interesting. Congress checks the president, president checks the Congress. Who checks the courts? And then a student raised her hand he said, and she said, now John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall is very uh, revered by the American judiciary. Were all of his decisions popular when he wrote them? And I hmm. said, stop, wait a minute. You're starting to spin all that. This is a, a, a trick. You, you've, been, you've had all this prepared. And they said, no. They said, you don't understand. Uh, we have been uh, studying your constitution since the Soviets left. We've been studying your constitutional history since the fourth grade. And I later told my wife that night and, and the university president, I, I said, if I'd had those questions wow. in an American class, I would have said, that's a great class. And this is what the rule of law, this is what, hmm. the, this is what the Constitution can mean. And, and later, the provost told me, they said, no, the student was right. Plus, on the Soviets, if you want to be a doctor, an engineer, an architect, you couldn't do it. Uh, and some of the best minds in Poland were teachers. And you saw the products of those minds. So that's how important the wow. rule of law is. There was one more over here somewhere. No? Yes. Justice Kennedy, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm a 1L. And I was just curious, we discussed a few books today, um, the Cardozo book, the Feldman book. I was wondering if there was any one or two particular recommendations you had for, uh, for uh, us as students, particularly busy uh, 1Ls tied up with uh, contracts reading. Oh, well, uh, and, and you know, I, I think the visit by Durand-Mott is, is a play. It's, 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 mag it's mag magnificent. One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, I've mentioned. And then standards, uh, 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 Kafka, uh, the trial. And the trial is really a much more, re it is, a, is a, uh, an allegory, a myth, but it's, it really, shows you the way most clients look at the legal system. Uh, Kafka, the, the trial, and, and Camus, um, uh, L'Etranger, and, and The Fall, uh, the, written in different styles. Uh, Camus became uh, confident enough that he didn't have to follow the Hemingway style like he did in, in, in uh, uh, L'Etranger. So he wrote The Fall, which is a great book about a, a turn, and, and, uh, and Billy Budd. And if you want to know about my generation, um, this was actually the 30s, but it was a carryover when I practiced law. Uh, women, when I went to this law school, there were five women in my class. Um, and so if you want to read, read about the old boy network, literally and figuratively, uh, but in a way of, uh, it had uh, many strong uh, 
features to read uh, James Gould Cousins, The Just and the Unjust. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. book. Well, I want to tell you that uh, in honor of your time on the court, 10 members of the faculty have written essays about 10 of your opinions. And we will give you those essays that may not be as good reading as Camus or some of the others that you mentioned. Uh, would everyone join me in recognizing the amazing Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Steve.